Greetings, friend. Welcome in to the comforts of the burrow and to a segment that I like to call Dungeon Deep Dive. Fuel up that lantern and pack your bag. Let's hit the trail. In today's video, we're going to be delving into a dungeon that is near and dear to my heart. The one, the only, Blister Burrow. The Blister Burrow comes from a game called Outward, an adventure RPG developed by a small company in Quebec, Canada, Nine Dot Studios. Outward is notorious for not holding the player's hand, and as such, maps of dungeons are non-existent. So I decided to take it upon myself and map out the Blister Burrow, and I wanted to take you guys along with me. The map that you'll see me drawing here is from a top-down isometric angle, which will give it a nice three-dimensional feel. The isometric fantasy map can be very satisfying to view, but honestly, not as practical as this true bird's-eye, two-dimensional, over-the-top view. So those of you who were hoping for a more practical map to use in the game, I've included here in a still shot a much more conventional map that should be more useful, with the cave's entrance being indicated by the red arrow here. But let's get back to something that's going to look a little more dynamic than that. The Blister Burrow is very much an early game dungeon in Outward. One of the NPCs in the starting village will give you a quest involving the collection of a rare mushroom shield. It's really a great early quest to take on for a new player, as most of the enemies inside the burrow will not put up a challenge that's greater than you can bear. And even if things prove to be a little difficult with the enemies, you can always employ stealth and sneak your way through to get the mushroom shield and some other valuable loot that will help you early on. The cave itself is located fairly close to the starting town of Sierzo. It's just slightly northeast of town. It is home to a small tribe of troglodytes, which are, as far as we can tell, some sort of organic fungi that has evolved to the point of sentience. They've built up a bit of a culture as they've developed artwork through sculpture making, through wooden structures that we'll see in the cave, as well as the worship of a deity of some sort. So they resemble humans in those ways, and some have even evolved to the point of using magic, which it's honestly kind of surprising when you see the nature of these beasts. So now that I've sketched out the entire dungeon using a pencil, I'm going over it now with a nice bold pen to make everything pop off the page, to make all the details nice and distinguishable. Although the Blister Burrow does not have stairs per se, it does have ramps and changes in elevations. I've decided to indicate those changes by drawing some crudely shaped stairs, just to make it more obvious on the paper what's happening. Anytime you're drawing a cave system like this, a natural dungeon, no line is straight. You want everything to have a sort of rustic feel. You want everything to look natural, part of the earth, part of the mountainside. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Nothing's straight, nothing's uniform. We're gonna fill in a couple more of these changes in elevations. Here we've got a little ramp down. As you can see, if I didn't indicate the stair type structure, it might not be clear on that one if it was a pathway down or if it was just a curve. This one here on the upward ascent, it, that one's a little easier to tell that it rises up, but I'll put the stairs there anyways. Then the steep descent on the back side of that archway, down to one of the lowest level rooms. And now I'm just filling in some shading, I'm doing some detail work on some of the stone columns and pillars that you'll find in the dungeon. What I'm doing here is giving the path more dimension and more sense of elevation by adding a subterranean portion to the path. On the lowest level rooms, I'm adding a thin layer to the bottom, a thin crust. And then as you can see, on the higher elevations, I've got a taller Earth's crust to indicate the height change. This gives the viewer of the drawing a much better sense of the high points of the dungeon versus the low points of the dungeon and the places in between. 
Now that all the pathways and rooms are pretty much pinned out, I'm doing some stipple work on the outer edges of the path, just to give it more texture, to give it a more natural feel, a more organic look. Now I'm adding cracks and shadows and things to the, I've been calling it the Earth's crust underneath, the, the portion of, of mountainside underneath the pathway. Just adding some details, extra little touches to, one, to differentiate it from the path even further, as well as give it some character. As you can see, I'm treating the stairways a little bit differently. I'm putting some hairline fractures in where the stairs come to the edge there. It's just kind of, again, differentiating it from the rest of it. As the map is evolving, those changes in elevations are really starting to make themselves evident and clear and obvious, which is exactly what we want. All right, and there we go. It's pretty much all pinned out. Now it's just ready to accept some color, accept some more life into it. For the base of the pathways, I basically started with a yellow, using colored pencil here, and then I went over it with a red. And now I'm layering it a third time here with the brown color. As you can see, that low-lying room there on the left is pretty much darker than anything that I have done up to this point, which is fine for an organic space like this. A dungeon's gonna have different shading on the floors. Everything's not gonna be uniform. Again, we're going back to the nothing straight, nothing's uniform mentality and thought process. So we're gonna be fine. I could have done with even more differences in the color palette for the pathway. And here we've got the archways that I've done some more detail work to to give them a little more natural feel, to give them a more rustic look. Now it's time to give the additional details some color. Color this treasure chest here. And we've got this ash giant, which is another one of the races in this game outward. And this ash giant seems to be dead, one, and it seems to be in the process of food preparation for the troglodytes. We've got some of the stone, which is like mana stone, which is purple in the game. So we're going to be coloring that. We've also got this kind of sky blue translucent stone. It looks like the aquamarine gemstones that you find in the game. So there it is, Blister Burrow. Fully colored, fully detailed, ready to be explored. So let's jump into it. From outside the cave, you'll notice the troglodytes wooden structures that they've constructed. You'll notice their carvings and sculptures. You'll notice some large fungi protruding from the cliff. Let's enter in. If you look at the top right corner of the map, that's where your character starts. And we'll track our character through this dungeon as we go using a dashed line. That way you can see where we are in accordance with the map. This adventurer's corpse right here at the front of the entrance has the potential to have some decent things. All the loot is RNG, so you'll get different drops. This first room brings us to a troglodyte. You'll always find this guy here. Some of the enemy spawns are a bit random, but this guy, he's always here. If we head east 
through the cave, we'll come to a right angle. There's a junk pile there. Again, especially early on, always good to sort through these junk piles and things to see what we've got. Then if we continue north on our east side, it will open up into a larger room with some of that aquamarine stone in the center. Oftentimes you'll find troglodytes here as we did in this run. Sometimes you won't though. Some of these other trogs are spread out around the dungeon. That initial troglodyte at the beginning, he's always there. But these guys aren't always here. But more often than not, they will be. And they're not too difficult to deal with. Sometimes you get multiple troglodytes on you and it gets kind of sketchy for you if you've got two or three or four which can happen in this dungeon in situations like that I do recommend retreating for a bit see if you can break up the pack and deal with maybe no more than two at a time to make it a lot easier on yourself also in this room we have some harvestable mana stone that I highly recommend that you mine from these nodes have the potential to provide precious gemstones along with the mana stone so I do suggest that you mine from every one of these nodes that you come across. So again, I wanted to reiterate that we're tracking our character through the dungeon with the dashed lines, so you can see our progress as we're going through. Here we are at the 90 degree bend in the path. We've got that aquamarine stone up ahead, sort of embedded in the side wall of the tunnel. Now we're coming up to the room with the pillar in the center. When you see that purple glow from one of the troglodytes, you know that he's one of the mages. He'll inflict some debuffs on your character. Not super crucial to avoid them, but it's good to try to deal with him quickly before he gets those off. He caught me right there with his spell. Now my character has two debuffs on him. The less noticeable red wispy markings indicate that I'm in pain, which causes me to take more damage overall with every hit. The more obvious pink squiggly lines means that I'm confused, causing my character to be staggered more easily while in combat. This hex cleaner right here in my inventory will bring me back to normal status and eliminate the confusion. If you turn back to the east right here, you'll find a puddle of thick oil, which is good for some alchemical recipes as well as refueling your lantern. If your lantern were to run out in a dungeon like this, it would be pretty much pitch black and you'd be left in the dark and anxiety levels would probably reach unprecedented heights. As you wrap around this curve, you'll head down a slight ramp and approach the inner sanctum of the blister burrow, kind of the hub of the troglodyte society. You're bound to find several troglodytes down here. Two, three, four, five even. So I suggest trying to lure maybe one at a time, maybe two at a time, back up the ramp towards the larger space that has the column in the middle. That gives you more room to work. So some of these troglodytes down here that you find will be unique in that they've been buffed by their leader. There's an archmage now in this dungeon that sort of leads this group. And he's buffed this guy here with some sort of ethereal damage coming off his weapon. It took more hits from my machete to get him to die as opposed to the other troglodytes. So you gotta be aware of things like that as well. And here comes the big archmage. We're gonna try to lead him out into a more open space give ourselves a little bit of room. We'll also varnish up our weapon with an ice rag, add some frost damage to our attacks. And 
It's kind of interesting with the big mage. He won't really get aggressive with you. He won't charge you. I ended up having to approach him here. And really, we ended up dealing with all these troglodytes right here in this little bend in the path. I guess not ideal as far as having space to work. But as long as you're dealing with one or two at the most, being in these tight quarters is not that big of a deal. It's usually something that the player can overcome. Now that he's been vanquished, we can just proceed with mop-up duty for any remaining trogs that happen to be wandering around. And then we can get prepared to enter the inner sanctum, hopefully in peace, without interruption from troglodytes. Here we are in the cavernous center of worship for the troglodytes. Here's this large mana stone pillar jutting up out of the ground at an angle. As you can see, they've got this statue set up sort of like a deity with a vessel in front of her as if for offerings. And here's where we find our mushroom shield. There's actually not much else down here besides that mushroom shield. There is a clean water source if you're desperate for it. But besides that, we're just going to make our way back up the ramp. Now we're going to continue east and go up the ramp, through this tunnel, and back down the other side. There's an iron ore vein that we can mine from. You may get a gemstone from that. Now we're dropping down into one of the lowest level rooms. We've got more aquamarine stone. We've got a mana stone here in the corner that we'll mine from. Again, you may get a hackmanite stone, which is a gemstone from that. There's a trog chest in here with some loot. It doesn't usually have great stuff, but you might find a couple things you could use. Now we're just going to make our way back on up. There's nothing else to do down there. We can go back to the entrance of the inner sanctum. But we can take this other forking path off to the north. That drops us down into the room with the ash giant. Lying on the floor close by is a giant garnet heart. It's basically a calcified or petrified ash giant heart. You can sell it for decent cash. There's some raw slabs of beef on the floor. I said beef, but it may not be beef. Okay, it may be ash giant meat, but this seems to be some sort of a kitchen for the troglodytes. There's another iron node that we mined from just now. Here's another corpse right here. This corpse happens to have a small sapphire in it. Okay, this is important if we want to open up the locked doors at the top of this dungeon, closer to the entrance. Here's the third and final corpse that you'll find in the Blister Burrow. Go ahead and gather any interesting loot from that. And here's another entrance into the Inner Sanctum. But we've already investigated that, so we'll wrap up the ramp back towards the front of the dungeon. And here's where those locked doors are. Okay, one of these doors requires a small sapphire, the other a tiny aquamarine. We happen to have both in our bag. So we're able to access the area.
And as you can see now, we're basically over the top of the Trog deity. We're looking out over the inner sanctum. And over here we've got some great life potions. And we have a scavenger coat and some scavenger boots which will give us better resistances against enemy attacks. Let's equip those. Alright, we're improving ourselves a bit. Now we'll just head out and make our way to where we started this whole thing. Oh, the troglodytes are cleared out. Nine regular ones, one mana trog, and the troglodyte archmage. The mushroom shield is in hand. We can collect our reward from that. Thanks for being here guys, thanks for watching, I hope you liked the video, if you did, cool, that's what it's for, to be enjoyed, and we'll see you on the next one. Goodbye, to all the troglodytes, to all their lives, they lived on well, but now I've got a golden cell. All their loot So I can, I can get, get some better boots, boots To hold my own heart of fights Goodbye to the troubled dice